Madam President, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs hearing entitled Sexual Assault in the Military Part 3, Context and Causes, will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that uh, members who may not be on this committee, like Ms. Harmon and uh, Ms. Davis, who may show up and anybody the uh, minority may want to have here, be allowed to participate in this hearing in accordance with committee rules. Uh, they'll be allowed to answer questions, ask questions of the witnesses after all official members of the subcommittee have had their turn first, without objection so ordered. And I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the subcommittee be allowed to submit a written statement for the record. And without objection, that is also ordered. So good afternoon. Uh, uh, thank you all for being here. I apologize in advance for what I expect is interruptions with votes on the floor. Uh, there's unfortunately no way that the subcommittee can control that, and it seems no matter how hard we try to plan these things without interruption, it doesn't always work that way. So we mean no disrespect. I'm sure the House means no disrespect or whatever. We appreciate your willingness to uh, tolerate that and to provide us with your expertise. Uh, Last summer, the subcommittee, subcommittee began its examination of what we perceive as a very serious problem. And we focused on the military sexual assault prevention and response programs. Later this summer, uh, we expect to have a new strategic plan from the Department of Defense's Sexual Assault Prevention and Response Office, uh, or SAPRO as they call it, uh, as well as a report from the Defense Task Force on Sexual Assault in the Military Services. So in the spirit of constructive oversight and in order to prepare for those forthcoming reports, and be able to evaluate them uh, in the proper context, we're taking a step back today to examine the underlying dynamics of this crime itself. Our witnesses that are here today are going to provide us insight into the nature of sexual assault and what factors might contribute to sexual violence within the military. Our goal here is simple. We need to become better informed about the causes of these vicious crimes that plague countless men and women in the military and society at large, and unfortunately, rape is one of the most underreported crimes in the United States, within both the military and the civilian populations. So consequently, there's been little ability to know for certain if sexual assaults are more prevalent in the military or if they occur at the same rate as in the general population. What we do know is that 2,908 sexual assaults were reported within the military in this last year. And it's estimated by some experts that as many as 60% of sexual assaults go unreported. Uh, if that's true, certainly the total is much higher, but even one is too many. While most physical wounds can heal, psychological wounds persist. Each incident has untold consequences that tear the essential fabric of a civilized society. Shattered trust and broken dreams, not to mention the incalculable strains on families, friendships, and careers. Sexual assault in the military presents a unique challenge to our society. It's our unwavering duty to protect the men and women that serve in the United States military. Unlike civilian society, we in government have a much stronger ability to control the environment and the culture in which we place our soldiers. If there are elements of this environment that can be changed to better protect the men and women who serve our country, then it's our duty to make those necessary changes. While progress seems to have been made in the past year toward improving prevention and response program within the armed forces, Sexual assault is still a grave concern, and we still have a way to go. This is not solely a woman's issue, nor is it simply an internal military problem. This is a matter of national security, something that all of us as citizens who benefit from the protections that our troops provide have to address. The last thing our sons and daughters should fear when they're putting their lives on the line to defend the country is being attacked by one of their own. If we can better understand the contributing factors that lead to sexual, sexual assault, that we'll be better able to create policies and programs to effectively prevent those crimes. And as I said, hopefully the information we get here today will let us better judge those policies that we hear about at the end of the summer and see whether or not they meet that standard. Our goal has to be nothing short of elimination of this pernicious crime within the armed services. So again, I want to conclude by thanking our witnesses for being here today and offering their expertise on the important issue. And I yield now to Mr. Turner uh, for opening comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for your leadership on this issue and for holding this hearing and the number of, of hearings and inquiries that you have done. This is a, a very serious and a very sensitive issue uh, that affects um, our, our military personnel. I also want to thank Representative Jane Harmon, who has been an incredible leader on this issue nationally. Uh, she's helped focus 
uh, really the, the troublesome um, issues of um, how people are placed at risk, how we can lessen uh, the number of sexual assaults, and, and what we can do to address this, uh, the, uh, the victims' rights and sexual assaults when they do occur. Um, I became involved in this issue um, at the um, uh, behest of Mary Lauterbach, who is the mother of Marine Lance Corporal Maria Lauterbach. Maria Lauterbach was uh, murdered and after she had come forward with allegations of, of sexual assault. Um, this occurred at Camp Lejeune, and there were a number of things that we learned about after the fact that had occurred in the, um, the issue of the investigation and that we tried to address in legislation. And I want to thank Jane Harmon again because of her partnerships in, in, in this issue um, in that uh, working together we were able to identify uh, some issues that we should change in our laws and things that we should try to um, advance with the Department of Defense. Uh, last year, as a result of what we learned from Maria Lauterbach's tragic death, we were, to get two, we were able to get two changes in the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, one is uh, that a military protective order would become a standing order because, unfortunately, in her case, her, her military protective order was allowed to expire. Um, secondly, uh, the law was changed to require that military protective orders um, be, um, be given as notice to civilian authorities because also in her case, when she became missing, and the local authorities were contacted, they were unaware that an M MPO had been issued and that she was uh, the subject of that MPO. In the 2010 Defense Authorization Act, uh, I worked with Jane Harmon again to try to bring provisions in that bill that would make a difference, and the bill that is on the floor today includes provisions that, uh, that Jane was advancing that go to the issue of uh, prevention, prosecution, and assistance to victims. Uh, there is also another provision that relates to the Marie Lauterbach case, and that is uh, that uh, the, a provision that would require that when a military protective order is issued, um, that again the, the individual has the subject matter of that, the, the victim, uh, would have an ability to get information. They should be notified of their right to request a base transfer for their protection. Uh, in Maria's case, uh, Maria Lauter Mary Lauterbach indicated that uh, she was informed by Maria that she had requested a base transfer and that had not been, been granted. Uh, the DOD does, uh, indicates they do not have a record of her having requested a transfer. Uh, this change would require that they provide notice to the subject of an MPO that they do have the ability uh, for a transfer. Um, this is an important issue, and every time we have a hearing, I think we learn something different that allows us to move forward with changes in legislation, changes in rules, uh, to try to go directly to the issue of how do we uh, protect our men and women who are serving, and how do we assist those who have been the subject of sexual assault. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I greatly appreciate your undertaking this. Uh, this is an important issue, and we have a duty to ensure that our service personnel are protected, and I want to again thank you for this hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turner, for your work on this issue as well. With that, we're going to now receive testimony from the panel before us today. I'll introduce each of them briefly uh, before the remarks begin. Dr. Veronique, Veronique Valier is the owner and director of two outpatient treatment centers, Valier and Counseling Associates, an outpatient treatment center for mental health, domestic violence and victim issues, and forensic treatment services, an outpatient violent offender treatment program. She has consulted and published on the treatment of sexual offenders and presented on the same at national and local sexual offender conferences. She also contributed to the report of the Defense Task Force on Sexual Harassment and Violence at the Military Service Academies and holds a doctor doctorate in clinical psychology from Rutgers University. Welcome. Dr. Fred Berlin is an associate professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the, Saint, at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, where he serves as director for the National Institute for the Study, Prevention, and Treatment of Sexual Trauma. Dr. Berlin is a highly regarded expert on the causes of sexual assault and the treatment of sexual assault offenders. He has participated in a number of federal and state government-sponsored conferences on sexual assault offender treatment and management, and Dr. Berlin holds a uh, MD from Dalhousie University. Dr. Elizabeth Hillman is a professor of law at the University of California Hastings College of Law, where she focuses on United States military law in history and the impact of gender and sexual norms in military culture. A veteran of the United States Air Force, she has previously taught at the Air Force Academy, Yale University, and Rutgers University School of Law in Camden. She has published studies on military sexual violence in a number of academic journals, and Dr. Hillman holds both a PhD and a JD from Yale University. Ms. Helen Benedict is a professor at the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia University. She is the author of five novels and five nonfiction books, including most recently The Lonely Soldier, The Private War of Women Serving in Iraq. 
She's also published a number of articles and essays on the issue of sexual assault in the military. Ms. Benedict holds an MA from the University of California at Berkeley. I want to thank you again for all making yourselves available to us today and uh, sharing uh, your perspectives and your expertise. It's the policy of this committee to swear in the witnesses before they testify, so I would ask if you all please stand and raise your right hand. Do you all uh, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will please reflect that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. I can share with you that we have a, a policy of trying to ask uh, folks to uh, just summarize their opening statements. We know you are good enough to provide extensive written uh, remarks, and all of those will be put on the record as a matter of course. With unanimous consent, uh, we do that. So your written remarks are on the record. If you could take about five minutes to please uh, just summarize those comments, and that way we can try to get to the members to allow them to ask appropriate questions and perhaps get a little more directed information as well. So, Ms. Valier, we we'll please start with you. We'll be uh, looking forward to your remarks. Thank you for inviting me today. Um, I was asked to testify on some of the psychology of the sexual offender. Um, my work has been with sexual offenders, and one of the things I wanted to highlight, especially in, in the context of sexual assault in the military, is helping to uh, explain the pathways of sexual offending. I think we're all familiar with the idea of sexual deviance, like a, a deviant sexual arousal to uh, prepubescent children, for example. But one of the things I find in my work that's overlooked is an understanding of the character pathway, or what the offender carries in his, or his personality that facilitates or allows sexual assault. And in character pathology, what we find is that there's an, a prevalence of narcissism, which is arrogant egocentricity, a sense of entitlement, a callousness, and lack of regard for the impact of the victim, and uh, an ability to exploit others for one's own gratification. People with this kind of character are throughout our society, but placed in a particular context or environment that both um, presents certain values that may that may uh, decrease external barriers to rape, as well as the issues that impact the victim, are very important in understanding this. And one of the examples I, I think might be relevant is, is a, the example of prison, for example. Um, a very antisocial criminal person who goes into prison who never has a history of sexual assault but becomes a prison rapist is, is a good metaphor to understand how systems create or merge uh, or collaborate with a certain type of personality to um, pre present and promote the risk of sexual assault. Um, and some of the things that if somebody becomes a rapist in prison, there are a lot of contextual issues, including issues that impact our beliefs and ideas about the victim that impact that. And when you have a character who has no internal barriers to harming others, they may find that sexual aggression is one way that they achieve sexual gratification, that outside their context, they may not. The military um, is a similar system to a prison, not to equate the people the same, but with the right type of character, that perfect storm helps. And some of the, if you have a character that's very narcissistic, very callous towards victims, very willing to use power and exploitation to meet their needs, and you put that character in an environment that's closed, um, that does its own investigation, that's male dominated, and that has a hierarchy that puts a high um, delineation between those in authority and those not in authority, as in prisoners and, and the uh, uh, officials in the prison or enlisted in officers, what you find is a system that presents an environment that with this callous or narcissistic character adheres to and colludes with the idea of um, power being more important, a devaluation of the victim, uh, a discreditation of vulnerability, a system that colludes with keeping things from authority, and um, along with attitudes towards the victim, like an us and them mentality. A, a person with a character pathology will be and thrive in that environment to engage in aggressive and assaultive behaviors. And if, if in their repertoire is the need for exploitive self-gratification for whatever reason, they're much more likely to act out on that. And not only that is 
we all in our environment have what you have mentioned, Mr. Chairman, a societal issue with victimization of secrecy. Um, the idea that the, ben the victim benefits from reporting, the group mentality to protect the offender, all those things. So in the context of this system, when you have somebody with this character, it's important to recognize that this sexually assaultive behavior is a reflection of that offender's character and is not necessarily reliant on a, some professional identification of sexual deviance. And, um, and that those things come together to collaborate to increase risk for a victim or a vulnerable person in that environment. Well, thank you very much for those comments. Now I have the disturbing news to tell you all that we've just been signaled down for eight votes, uh, which could take probably uh, 30 to 40 minutes minimally on that. Are any of you going to have difficulty uh, remaining here uh, to respond after that? I don't want to make your personal lives uh, problematic either. So if you're not, we, we appreciate your forbearance. Again, we apologize for it. We'll see you back here uh, in a half hour or so and, and uh, proceed from that point, hopefully at that point, without interruption to the balance of the hearing. Thank you.